Chapter 24 of Legacy by James H. Schmitz. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Legacy, Chapter 24. Quillen took over the ship controls, and the commissioner and Trigger went with the recorder into the little office back of the transmitter cabinet to slam out some fast reports to the hub and other points. Lyad was apologizing profoundly to Mantellish as they left the lounge. The professor was huffing back at her, rather mildly. A little while later, Lyad, showing indications of restrained surprise, was helping Trigger prepare dinner. They took it into the lounge. Quillen remained at the controls while the others started eating. Trigger fixed up a tray and brought it to him. "'Thanks for the rescue, Major,' she said. He grinned up at her. It was a pleasure." Trigger glanced back at the little group in the lounge. "'Think she was fibbing a bit?' "'Sure. Mainly, she decided in advance how much to tell and how much not. She thinks fast in action, though. No slips. What she told of what she knows makes a solid story, and with angles we can check on fast. So it's bound to have plenty of information in it. It'll do for the moment. She's already started buttering up Mantellish, said Trigger. She'll do that, Quillen said. By the time we reach Luscious, the prof probably might as well be back in the trances. The commissioner intends to give her a little rope, I think. How close is Luscious to that area she showed? Quillen flicked on their core screen and superimposed the map Lyad had marked. Red dots well inside, he pointed out. That bit was probably quite solid info." He looked up at her. "'Did it bother you much to hear the De Vegas have dropped the grab idea and are out to do you in?' Trigger shook her head. "'Not really,' she said. "'Wouldn't make much difference one way or the other, would it?' "'Very little.' He patted her hand. "'Well, they're not going to get you, doll, one way or the other.' Trigger smiled. "'I believe you.' she said. Thanks." She looked back into the lounge again. Just at present she did have a feeling of relaxed, unconcerned security. It probably wasn't going to last, though. She glanced at Quillen. "'Those computers of yours,' she said. What did they have to say about that not catassin you squashed?' "'The crazy things claim now it was a plasmoid,' Quillen said. Revolting notion but it makes some sense for once. Checks with some of the things Lyad told us, too. Do you remember that Vethi sponge Balmorden was carrying? Yes. It didn't come off the ship with him. He checked it out as having died en route. That is a revolting notion, Trigger said after a moment. Well, at least we've got detectors now. But the feeling of security had faded somewhat again. Before dinner was half over, the long-range transmitters abruptly came to life. For the next thirty minutes or so, messages rattled in incessantly, as assorted headquarters here and there reacted to the Emmertine's report. The commissioner sat in the little office and sorted over the incoming information. Trigger stayed at the transmitters, feeding it to him as it arrived. None of it affected them directly. They were already headed for the point in space a great many other people would now start heading for very soon. Then business dropped off again almost as suddenly as it had picked up. A half-dozen low-priority items straggled in, in as many minutes. The transmitters purred idly. Then the person-to-person -person buzzer sounded. Trigger punched the screen button. A voice pronounced the ship's dial number. Acknowledging, Trigger said, who is it? Oredo Comweb Center, said the voice. Stand by for contact with Federation Councilman Roadgear. Trigger whacked the panic button. Roadgear was a name. Standing by, she said. Commissioner Tate came in through the door and slipped into the chair she'd already vacated. Trigger took another seat a few feet away. She felt a little nervous, but she'd always wanted to see a high-powered diplomat in action. The screen lit up. She recognized Roadgear from his picks. Tall, fine-looking man of the silvered sideburns type. He was in an armchair in a very plush office. 
"'Congratulations, Commissioner,' he said, smiling. "'I believe you're aware by now that your latest report has set many wheels spinning rapidly.' "'I rather expected it would,' the Commissioner admitted. He also smiled. They pitched it back and forth a few times, very chummy. Roadgear didn't appear to be involved in any specific way with the operations which soon would center about Luscious. Trigger began to wonder what he was after. "'A few of us are rather curious to know,' Roadgear said, "'why you didn't acknowledge the last council order sent you.' Trigger didn't quite start nervously. "'When was this?' asked the Commissioner. Roadgear smiled softly and told him. "'Got a record here of some scrambled item that arrived about then,' the Commissioner said. "'Very good of you to call me about it, Councilman. What was the order content?' It's dated now as it happens, Roadgear said. Actually, I'm calling about another matter. The First Lady of Trenest appears to have been very obliging about informing you of some of her recent activities. The Commissioner nodded. Yes, very obliging. And in so short a time after her, ah, uh, detainment, you must have been very persuasive. Well, Holati Tate said, no more than usually." "'Yes,' said Councilman Roadgear. "'Now, there's been some slight concern expressed by some members of the Council. Well, let's say they just like to be reassured that the amenities one observes in dealing with a head of state actually are being observed in this case. I'm sure they are, of course.' The Commissioner was silent a moment. "'I was informed a while ago,' he said that full responsibility for this head of state has been assigned to my group. Is that correct?" The councilman reddened very slightly. "'Quite,' he said. "'The official council order should reach you in a day or so.' "'Well, then,' said the commissioner, "'I'll assure you, and you can assure the councilman, who are feeling concerned that the amenities are being observed. Then everybody can relax again. Is that all right?' No, not quite," Roadgear said annoyedly. In fact, the councilman would very much prefer it, Commissioner, if I were given an opportunity to speak to the First Lady directly to reassure myself on the point. Well, Commissioner Tate said, she can't come to the transmitters right now, she's washing the dishes. The councilman reddened very considerably this time. He stared at the Commissioner a moment longer. Then he said in a very soft voice, "'Oh, the hell with it!' He added, "'Good luck, Commissioner. You're going to need it some time.' The screen went blank. The scouts of Sealand's independent fleet, who had first looked this planet over and decided to call it Luscious, had selected a name, Trigger thought, which probably would stick. Because that was what it was at least in the area where they were camping. She rolled over from her side to her face and gave herself a push away from the rock she'd been regarding contemplatively for the past few minutes. Feet first, she went drifting out into a somewhat deeper section of Plasmoid Creek. None of it was very deep. There were pools here and there, in the stretch of the creek she usually came to, where she could stand on her toes in the warm clear water and, arms stretched straight up, barely tickle the surface with her fingertips. But along most of the stretch the bigger rocks weren't even submerged. She came sliding over the sand to another rock, turned on her back and leaned up against the rock, blinking at sun reflections along the water. Camp was a couple of hundred yards down the valley, its sounds cut off by a rise of the ground. The Commissioner's ship was there, plus a half-dozen tents plus a sizable I-fleet unit with lab facilities which Sealand's outfit had loaned Mantellish for the duration. There were some fifteen, twenty people in all about the camp at the moment. They knew she was loafing around in the water up here and wouldn't disturb her. Strictly speaking, of course, she wasn't loafing. She was learning how to listen to herself think. She didn't feel she was getting the knack of it too quickly, but it was coming. The best way seemed to be to let go mentally as much as possible, to wait without impatience, really to more or less listen quietly within yourself, 
as if he were looking around in some strange forest, letting whatever wanted to come to view come and fade again, as something else rose to view instead. The main difficulty was with the business of relaxing mentally, which wasn't at all her natural method of approaching a problem. But when she could do it, information of a kind that was beginning to look very interesting was likely to come filtering into her awareness. Whatever was at work deep in her mind, and she could give a pretty fair guess at what it was now, seemed as weak and slow as the psychology service people had indicated. The traces of its work were usually faint and vague, but gradually the traces were forming into some very definite pictures. Lazing around in the waters of Plasmoid Creek for an hour or so every morning had turned out to be a helpful part of the process. On the flashing, all-out run to Luscious, subspace all the way, with the Commissioner and Quillen spelling each other around the clock at the controls, the transmitters clattering for attention every half-hour, the ship's housekeeping had to be handled, and somebody besides Mantellish needed to keep a moderately beady eye on the Ermitine. She hadn't even thought of acting on Pilch's suggestion. But once they landed, there suddenly wasn't much to keep her busy, and she could shift priority to listening to herself think. It was one of those interim periods where everything was being prepared and nothing got started. As a plasmoid planet, Luscious was pretty much of a bust. It was true that plasmoids were here. It was also true that until fairly recently plasmoids were being produced here. By the simple method of looking where they were thickest, Seedland's people even had located the plasmoid which had been producing the others, several days before Mantellish arrived to confirm their find. This one, by the plasmoid standards of Luscious, was a regular monster, some twenty-five inches high. A gray, mummy-like thing, dead and half-rotted inside. It was the first plasmoid, with the possible exception of whatever had flattened itself out on Quillen's gravity mine, known to have died. There had been very considerable excitement when it was first discovered, because the description made it sound very much as if they'd finally located 112-113. They hadn't. This one, if Trigger had followed Mantellus correctly, could be regarded as a cheap imitation of 112, and its productions, compared with the working plastic life of Harvest Moon, appeared to be strictly on a kindergarten level, nuts and bolts and less than that. To Trigger, most of the ones that had been collected looked like assorted bugs and worms, though one at least was the size of a small pig. "'No form, no pattern,' Mantellish rumbled. "'Was the thing practicing? Did it attempt to construct an assistant and set it down here to test it? Well, now—' He went off again to incomprehensibilities, apparently no longer entirely dissatisfied. Get me one twelve, he bellowed. Then this business will be solved. Meanwhile, we now at least have plasmoid material to waste. We can experiment boldly. Come, Lyad, my dear. And Lyad followed him into the lab unit, where they went to work again, dissecting, burning, stimulating, inoculating, and so forth, great numbers of more or less pancake sized subplasmoids. This morning, Trigger wasn't getting down to the best semi-drowsy level at all readily. And it might very well be that lyad my dear business. You know, she had told the Commissioner thoughtfully the day before, by the time we're done, lyad will know more about plasmoids than anyone in the hub except Mantellish. He didn't look concerned. Won't matter much. By the time we're done, she and the rest of the Ermitines will have had to cough up control of Trinest. They've broken treaty with this business." Oh, Trigger said. Does Lyad know that? Sure. She also knows she's getting off easy. If she were a Federation citizen, she'd be up for a compulsory rehabilitation right now. She'll try something if she gets half a chance, Trigger warned. Sure she will, the Commissioner said absently. He went on with his work. It didn't seem to be Lyad that was bothering. Trigger lay flat on her back in the shallow sandbar, arms behind her head, feeling the sun's warmth on her closed eyelids. She watched her thoughts drifting by slowly. 
It just might be Quillen. Old Major Quillen, the rescuer in time of need, the not catassin smasher Quite a guy. The water murmured past her. On the right out here they'd run by one another now and then, going from job to job. After they'd arrived, Quillen was gone three-quarters of the time, helping out in the hunt for the concealed de Vegas fortress. It was still concealed, they hadn't yet picked up a trace. But every so often he made it back to camp, and every so often when he was back in camp and didn't think she was looking, he'd be sitting there looking at her. Trigger grinned happily. Old Major Quillen. Being bashful. Well, now. And that did it. She could feel herself relaxing, slipping down and away, drifting down through her mind, farther, deeper, toward the tiny voice that spoke in such a strange language and was still becoming daily more comprehensible. Ah, uh, say, Trigger! End of chapter 24「Chapter Twenty Five of Legacy by James H. Schmitz. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Legacy, Chapter Twenty Five. Trigger gasped. Her eyes flew open. She made a convulsive effort to vanish beneath the surface of the creek. Being flat on the sand as it was, that didn't work. So she stopped splashing about and made rapid covering up motions here and there instead. You've got a nerve! she snapped as her breath came back. Beat it! Fast! Old bashful Quillen, standing on the bank fifteen feet above her, looked hurt. He also looked. Look, he said plaintively, I just came over to make sure you were all right. Wild animals around. I wasn't studying the color scheme. Beat it! At once! Quillen inhaled with apparent difficulty. Though now it's been mentioned, he went on, speaking rapidly and unevenly, there is all that brown and that sort of pink and that lovely white. He was getting more enthusiastic by the moment. Trigger became afraid he would fall off the bank and land in the creek beside her. And the, oh, um, wet red hair and the freckles, he rattled along, his eyes starting out of his head, and the lovely, Quillen! she yelled, please! Quillen checked himself. Ah, uh, he said. He drew a deep breath. The wild look faded. Sanity appeared to return. Well, it's the truth about those wild animals. Some sort of large, uncouth critter was observed just now ducking into the forest at the upper end of the valley. Trigger darted a glance along the bank. Her clothes were forty feet away, just beside the water. I'm observing some sort of large, uncouth critter right here," she said coldly. What's worse, it's observing me. Turn around." Quillen sighed. You're a hard woman, R.G., he said, but he turned. He was carrying a holstered gun, as a matter of fact, but he usually did that nowadays anyway. This thing, he went on, is supposed to have a head like a bat, three feet across. It flies. Very interesting, Trigger told him. She decided he wasn't going to turn around again. So now I'll just get into my clothes and then... It came quietly out of the trees around the upper bend of the creek sixty feet away. It had a head like a bat, and was blue on top and yellow below. Its flopping wingtips barely cleared the bank on either side. The three-foot mouth was wide open, showing very long, thin white teeth. It came skimming swiftly over the surface of the water toward her. Quillen! They walked back along the trail to camp. Trigger walked a few steps ahead, her back very straight. The worst of it had been the smug look on his face. Heel, she observed. Heel, heel, heel. Now, Trigger, Quillen said calmly behind her, after all, it was you who came flying up the bank and wrapped yourself around my neck, all wet, too. I was scared, Trigger snarled. Who wouldn't be? 
you certainly didn't hesitate an instant to take full advantage of the situation." True, Quillen admitted. I dropped the bat. There you were. Who'd hesitate? I'm not out of my mind. She did two dance steps of pure rage and spun to face him. She put her hands on her hips. Quillen stopped warily. Your mind, she said. I'd hate to have one like it. What do you think I am? One of Belchick's hoories? For a man his size, he was really extremely quick. Before she could move, he was there, one big arm wrapped about her shoulders, pinning her arms to her sides. Easy, Trigger, he said softly. Well, others had tried to hold her like that when she didn't want to be held. A twist, a jerk, a heave, and over and down they went. Trigger braced herself quietly. If she was quick enough now, she twisted, jerked, heaved. She stopped, discouraged. The situation hadn't altered appreciably. She had been afraid it wasn't going to work with Quillen. Let go, she said furiously, aiming a fast heel at his instep. But the instep flicked aside. Her shoe dug into the turf of the path. The ape might even have an extra pair of eyes on his feet. Then his free palm was cupped under her chin, tilting it carefully. His other eyes appeared above hers. Very close, very dark. "'I'll bite!' Trigger whispered fiercely. "'I'll bite! Mmph! Mmph! Grrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
Lyad and Trigger stayed at camp. Luscious looked very lonely. It isn't just the King Plasmoid they're hoping to catch there, the Commissioner told Trigger. And I wouldn't care, frankly, if the thing stayed lost the next few thousand years. But we had a very odd report last week. The Federation's undercover boys have been scanning the De Vegas world's entrenest very closely of late, naturally. The report is that there isn't the slightest evidence that a single one of the top members of the De Vegas hierarchy has been on any of their worlds in the past two months. Oh, she said, they think they're out here? In that dome? That's what's suspected. But why? He scratched his chin. If anyone knows, they haven't told me. It's probably nothing nice. Trigger pondered. You'd think they'd use facsimiles, she said, like Lyad. Oh, they did, he said, they did. That's one of the reasons for being pretty sure they're gone. They're nowhere near as expert at that facsimile business as the Trenest characters. A little study of the recordings showed the facts were just that." Trigger pondered again. Did they find anything on Trenest? Yes. One combat strength squadron of those souped-up frigates of the Aurora class they're allowed by treaty can't be accounted for. Trigger cupped her chin in her hands and looked at him. Is that why we've stayed on Luscious Holati, the four of us? It's one reason. That repulsive thing of yours is another. What about him? I have a pretty strong feeling, he said, that while they'll probably find the hierarchy in that De Vegas dome, they won't find the one twelve one thirteen item there. So Lyad is still gambling, Trigger said. And we're gambling we'll get more out of her next play than she does. She hesitated. Holati? Yes. When did you decide it would be better if nobody ever got to see that King Plasmoid again?" Holati Tate said, "'About the time I saw the reconstruct of that yellow monster of Belmorden's. Frankly, Trigger, there was a good deal of discussion of possibilities along that line before we decided to announce the discovery of Harvest Moon. If we could have just kept it hidden away for a couple of centuries, until there was considerably more good sense around the hub, we probably would have done it but somebody was bound to run across it sometime. And the stuff did look as if it might be extremely valuable. So we took the chance. And now you'd like to untake it? If it's still possible. Half the Fed Council probably would like to see it happen. But they don't even dare think along those lines. There could be a blow-up that would throw hub politics back into the kind of snarl they haven't been in for a hundred years. If anything is done, it will have to look as if it had been something nobody could have helped, and that still might be bad enough." "'I suppose so. Holati?' "'Yes?' She shook her head. "'Nothing. Or if it is, I'll ask you later.' She stood up. "'I think I'll go have my swim.' She still went loafing in Plasmoid Creek in the mornings. The bat had been identified as an innocent victim of appearances, a very mild-mannered beast dedicated to the pursuit and engulfment of huge moth-like bugs which hung around watercourses. Luscious still looked like the safest of all possible worlds for any creature as vigorous as a human being. But she kept the Denton near now, just in case. She stretched out again in the sun-warmed water, selected a smooth rock to rest her head on, wriggled into the sand a little so the current wouldn't shift her, and closed her eyes. She lay still, breathing slowly. Contact was coming more easily and quickly every morning. But the information which had begun to filter through in the last few days wasn't at all calculated to make one happy. She was afraid now she was going to die in this thing. She had almost let it slip out to Halati, which wouldn't have helped in the least. She'd have to watch that in the future. Repulsive hadn't exactly said she would die. He'd said, maybe. Repulsive was scared, too. Scared badly. Trigger lay quiet, her thoughts, her attention drifting softly inward and down. Creek water rippled against her cheek. It was all because that one clock moved so slowly. 
That was the thing that couldn't be changed. Ever. End of chapter 25「Twenty Six of Legacy by James H. Schmitz. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Legacy, Chapter Twenty Six. Three mornings later, the emergency signal called her back to camp on the double. Trigger in over the developments of the past days in her mind as she trotted along the path, getting dressed more or less on the way. The De Vegas dome was solidly invested by now its transmitters blanked out. It hadn't tried to communicate with its attackers. On their part, the Fed ships weren't pushing the attack. They were holding the point, waiting for the big, slow-wrecking boats to arrive, which would very gently and very delicately start uncovering and opening the dome, taking it apart piece by piece. The hierarchy could surrender themselves and whatever they were hiding in there at any point in the process. They didn't have a chance. Nobody and nothing had escaped. The scouts had swatted down a few De Vegas vessels on the way in, but those had been headed toward the dome, not away from it. Perhaps the psychology service ship had arrived, several days ahead of time. The other three weren't in camp, but the lock to the commissioner's ship stood open. Trigger went in and found them gathered up front. The commissioner had swung the transmitter cabinet aside and was back there, prowling among the power leads. What's wrong? Trigger asked. Transmitters went out, he said. Don't know why yet. Grab some tools and help me check. She slipped on her work gloves, grabbed some tools and joined him. Lyad and Mentellish watched them silently. They found the first spots of the fungus a few minutes later. Fungus, Mentellish said, startled. He began to rumble in his pockets. My microscope. I have it. Lyad handed it to him. She looked at him with concern. "'You don't think—' "'It seems possible. We did come in here last night, remember? And we came straight from the lab.' "'But we had been decontaminated,' Lyad said, puzzledly. "'Don't try to walk in here, Professor,' Trigger warned as he lumbered forward. "'We might have to de-electrocute you. The Commissioner will scrape off a sample and hand it out. This stuff if it's what you think it might be, is poisonous?" "'Quite harmless to life, my dear,' said the professor, bending over the patch of greenish-gray scum the commissioner had reached out to him. "'But ruinous and delicate instruments. That's why we're so careful.' Holati Tate glanced at Trigger. "'Better look in the black box, Trigg,' he said. She nodded and wormed herself farther into the innards of the transmitters. A minute later she announced, "'Full of it!' and that's the one part we can't repair or replace, of course. Is it your beast, Professor?" "'It seems to be,' Mantellus said unhappily. "'But we have, at least, a solvent which will remove it from the equipment.' Trigger came sliding out from under the transmitters, the detached black box under one arm. "'Better use it then before the stuff gets to the rest of the ship. It won't help the black box.' She shook it. It tinkled. "'Shot,' she said. There went another quarter million of your credits, Commissioner." Mantellish and Lyad headed for the lock to get the solvent. Trigger slipped off her work gloves and turned to follow them. "'Might be a while before I'm back,' she said. The Commissioner started to say something, then nodded and climbed back into the transmitters. After a few minutes, Mantellish came puffing in with sprayers and cans of solvent. "'It's at least fortunate you tried to put out a call just now,' he said it might have done incalculable damage." "'Doubt it,' said Holati. "'A few more instruments might have gone. Like the communicators. The main equipment is fungus-proof. How do you attach this thing?' Mantella showed him. The Commissioner thanked him. He directed a fine spray of the solvent into the black box and watched the fungus melt. "'Happen to notice where Trigger and Lyad went?' he asked. "'Eh?' said Mantellish. He reflected. I saw them walking down toward camp, talking together as I came in," he called. Should I go get them? Don't bother, Holati said. They'll be back. They came walking back into the ship around half an hour later. Both faces looked rather white and strained. 
Lyad has something she wants to tell you, Halati, Trigger said. Where's Mantellish? In his lab. Taking a nap, I believe. That's good. We don't want him here for this. Go ahead, Lyad. Just the important stuff. You can give us the details after we've left. Three hours later, the ship was well away from Luscious, traveling subspace, traveling fast. Trigger walked up into the control section. Mantellish is still asleep, she said. They'd fed the professor a doped drink to get him aboard without detailed explanation and argument about how much of the lab should be loaded on the ship first. Shall I get Lyad out of her cabin for the rest of the story, or wait till he wakes up? Better wait, said the commissioner. He'll come out of it in about an hour, and he might as well hear it with us. Looks like navigating is going to be a little rough for a spell anyway. Trigger nodded and sat down in the control next to his. After a while, he glanced over at her. How did you get her to talk? he asked. We went back into the woods a bit. I tied her over a stump and broke two sticks across the first seat of Trenest. Got the idea from Mahul, sort of, Trigger added vaguely. When I picked up a third stick, Lyad got awfully anxious to keep things at just a fast conversational level. We kept it there. Hmm, said the Commissioner. You don't feel she did any lying this time? I doubt it. I tapped her one now and then, just to make sure she didn't slow down enough to do much thinking. Besides, I got the whole business down on a pocket recorder and Lyad knew it. If she makes one more goof till this deal is over, the recording gets released to the hub's news viewer outfits, yowls and all. She'd sooner lose Trenest than risk having that happen. She'll be good." "'Yeah, probably,' he said thoughtfully. "'About that substation. Would you feel more comfortable if we went after the bunch round the De Vegas Dome first and got us an escort for the trip?' "'Sure,' Trigger said. But that would just about kill any chances of doing anything personally, wouldn't it?" "'I'm afraid so. Scout intelligence will go along pretty far with me. But they couldn't go that far. We might be able to contact Quillen individually, though. He's a top-notch man and a fighter." "'It does seem to me,' Trigger said, "'that we ought to run any risk of being spotted till we know exactly what this thing is like.' "'Well,' said the Commissioner, "'I'm with you there. We shouldn't. What about Mantellish and Lyad? You can't let them know, either." The Commissioner motioned with his head. The rest cubicle back of the cabins. If we see a chance to do anything, we'll pop them both into rest. I can dream up something to make that look plausible afterwards, I think." Trigger was silent a moment. Lyad had told them she'd dispatched the Aurora to stand guard over a subspace station where the missing King Plasmoid presently was housed until both she and the combat squadron from Trenest could arrive there. The exact location of that station had been the most valuable of the bits of information she had extracted so painstakingly from Belmorden. The coordinates were centered on the Commissioner's course screen at the moment. "'How about that Trenest squadron?' Trigger asked. "'Think Lyad might have risked a lie, and they could get out here in time to interfere?' "'No,' said the Commissioner. She had to have some idea of where to send them before starting them out of the hub. They'll be doing fine if they make it to the substation in another two weeks. Now the Aurora. If they started for Luscious right after Lyad called them last night, at best they can't get there any sooner than we can get to the substation. I figure that at four days. If they turn right around then and start back... Trigger laughed. You can bet on that, she said. The Commissioner had used his ship's guns to brand the substation's coordinates in twenty-mile figures into a mountain plateau above Plasmoid Creek. They left much more detailed information in camp, but there was a chance it would be overlooked in too hurried a search. "'Then they'll show up at the substation again four or five days behind us,' the Commissioner said. "'So they're no problem. But our own outfit's fastest ships can cut across from the De Vegas Dome in less than three days after their search party messages from Luscious to tell them why we've stopped transmitting and where we've gone. Or the psychology ship might get to Luscious before the search party does and start transmitting about the coordinates. In any case, said Trigger, it's our own boys who are likely to be the problem. Yes, I'd say we should have two days, give or take a few hours, 
after we get to the station to see if we can do anything useful and get it done. Of course, somebody might come wandering into Luscious right now and start wondering about those coordinate figures, or drop in at our camp and discover we're gone. But that's not very likely, after all." Couldn't be helped anyway, Trigger said. No. If we knock ourselves out on this job, somebody besides Lyad's Treness squadron and the De Vegas have to know just where the station is. He shook his head. That Lyad. I figured she'd know how to run the transmitters, so I gave her the chance. But I never imagined she'd be a good enough engineer to get inside them and mess them up without killing herself. Lyad has her points, Trigger said. Too bad she grew up a rat. You had a playback attachment stuck in there, then? Naturally. Full of the fungus, I suppose? Full of it, said the Commissioner. Well, Lyad still lost on that maneuver. Much less comfortably than she might have, too. I think she'd agree with you there, Trigger said. Lyad's first assignment after Professor Mantelish came out of the dope was to snap him back into trance and explain to him how he had once more been put under a hypno-control and used for her felonious ends by the First Lady of Trenest. They let him work off his rage while he was still under partial control. Then the Ermitine woke him up. He stared at her coldly. "'You are a deceitful woman, Lyad Emmertine, he declared. "'I don't wish to see you about my labs again, at any time, under any pretext. Is that understood?' Yes, Professor, Lyad said. And I'm sorry that I believed it necessary to— Mantelli snorted. Sorry! Necessary! Just to be certain it doesn't happen again, I shall make up a batch of anti-hypno pills, if I can remember the prescription. I happen, the Ermitine ventured, to know a very good prescription for the purpose, Professor, if you will permit me. Mantelli stood up. I'll accept no prescriptions from you he said icily. He looked at Trigger as he turned to walk out of the cabin. "'Or drinks from you, either, Trigger R.G.' he growled. "'Who in the great spiraling galaxy is there left to trust?' "'Sorry, Professor,' Trigger said meekly. In half an hour or so he calmed down enough to join the others in the lounge, to get the final story on Guess Fail and the missing King Plasmoid from the Ermitine. Dr. Guess Fail, Lyad reported, had died very shortly after leaving the Manon system. And with him had died every man on board the u League's transport ship. It might be simplest, she went on, to relate the first series of events from the plasmoid's point of view. Point of view? Professor Mantellish interrupted. The plasmoid has awareness, then? Oh, yes, that one does. Self-awareness? Definitely. Oh, ho! Oh. But then... Professor... Trigger interrupted politely in turn. May I get you a drink? He glared at her, growled, then grinned. I'll shut up, he said. Lyad went on. Dr. Fail had resumed experimentation with the 112-113 unit almost as soon as he was alone with it, and one of the first things he did was to detach the small 113 section from the main one. The point Dr. Fail hadn't adequately considered when he took this step was that 113's function appeared to be that of a restraining, limiting, or counteracting device on its vastly larger partner. The old galactics obviously had been aware of dangerous potentialities in their more advanced creations, and had used this means of regulating them. That the method was reliable was indicated by the fact that, in the thirty thousand years since the old galactics had vanished, Plasmoid 112 had remained restricted to the operations required for the maintenance of Harvest Moon. But it hadn't liked being restricted. And it had been very much aware of the possibilities offered by the new life-forms which lately had intruded on Harvest Moon. The instant it found itself free, it attempted to take control of the human minds in its environment. "'Mind-level control?' Mantellish exclaimed, looking startled. Not unheard of, of course, and we'd been considering. But of human minds? Lyad nodded. It can contact human minds, she said, though, perhaps rather fortunately, it can project that particular field effect only within a quite limited radius. A little less, the De Vegas found later, than five miles. Mantella shook his head, frowning. He turned toward the Commissioner. Holadi? 
he said emphatically, I believe that thing could be dangerous. For a moment they all looked at him. Then the commissioner cleared his throat. It's a possibility, Mantellish, he admitted. We will give it thought later. What, Trigger asked Lyad, killed the people on the ship? The attempt to control them, Lyad said. Dr. Fale apparently had died as he was leaving the laboratory with the 113 unit. The other men died wherever they were. The ship, running subspace and pilotless, plowed headlong into the next gravitic twister and broke up. A De Vega ship's detectors picked up the wreckage three days later. Belmorden was on board the De Vega ship and in charge. The De Vegas, at that time, were at least as plasmoid-hungry as anybody else, and knew they were not likely to see their hunger gratified for several decades. The wreck of a U-League ship in the Manon area decidedly was worth investigating. If the big plasmoid hadn't been capable of learning from its mistakes, the De Vega's investigating party also would have died. Since it could and did learn, they lived. The searchers discovered human remains and the crushed remnants of the 113 unit in a collapsed section of the ship. Then they discovered the big plasmoid, alive in subspace, undamaged and very conscious of the difficulties it now faced. It had already initiated its first attempt to solve the difficulties. It was incapable of outward motion and could not change its own structure, but it was no longer alone. It had constructed a small work plasmoid with visual and manipulating organs, as indifferent to exposure to subspace as its designer. When the boarding party encountered the twain, the working plasmoid apparently was attempting to perform some operation on the frozen and shriveled brain of one of the human cadavers. Belmorden was a scientist of no mean stature among the De Vegas. He did not understand immediately what he saw, but he realized the probable importance of understanding it. He had the plasmoids and their lifeless human research object transferred to the De Vegas ship and settled down to observe what they did. Released, the working plasmoid went back immediately to its task. It completed it. Then Balmorden, and presumably the plasmoids, waited. Nothing happened. Finally, Balmorden investigated the dead brain. Installed in it, he found what appeared to be near-microscopic energy receivers of plasmoid material. There was nothing to indicate what type of energy they were to or could receive. De Vegas scientists, when they happened to be of the hierarchy, always had enjoyed one great advantage over most of their colleagues in the Federation. They had no difficulty in obtaining human volunteers to act as subjects for experimental work. Balmorden appointed three of his least valuable crew members as volunteers for the plasmoids' experiments. The first of the three died almost immediately. The plasmoid, it turned out, lacked understanding of, among other things, the use and need of anesthetics. Balmorden, accordingly, assisted obligingly in the second operation. He was delighted when it became apparent that his assistance was being willingly and comprehendingly accepted. This subject did not die immediately, but he did not regain consciousness after the plasmoid devices had been installed, and some hours later he did die in convulsions. Number three was more fortunate. He regained consciousness. He complained of headaches, and after he had slept, of nightmares. The next day he went into shock for a period of several hours. When he came out of it, he reported tremblingly that the big plasmoid was talking to him, though he could not understand what it said. There were two more test operations, both successful. In all three cases, the headaches and nightmares stopped in about a week. The first subject in the series was beginning to understand the plasmoid. Balmorden listened to his reports. He had his three surviving volunteers given very extensive physical and psychological tests. They seemed to be in fine condition. Balmorden now had the operation performed on himself. When he woke up, he disposed of his three predecessors. Then he devoted his full attention to learning what the plasmoid was trying to say. In about three weeks it became clear. The plasmoid had established contact with human beings because it needed their help. It needed a base like Harvest Moon from which to operate and on which to provide for its requirements. It did not have the understanding to permit it to construct such a base. So it made the De Vegas a proposition. 
It would work for them, somewhat as it had worked for the old Galactics, if, unlike the old Galactics, they would work for it. Balmordan, newly become a person of foremost importance, transmitted the offer to the hierarchy in the hub. With no hesitation it was accepted, but Balmordan was warned not to bring his monster into the hub area. If it was discovered on a De Vegas world, the hierarchy would be faced with a choice between another war with the Federation and submission to more severely restrictive Federation controls. It didn't care for either alternative. It had lost three wars with the Federated worlds in the past, and each time had been reduced in strength. They contacted Vishni's independent fleet. Vishni's area was not too far from Belmorden's ship position, and the De Vegas had had previous dealings with him and his men. This time they hired the I-Fleet to become the plasmoid's temporary caretaker. Within a few weeks it was parked on Luscious, where it devoted itself to the minor creative experimentation which presently was to puzzle Professor Mantellish. The De Vegas, meanwhile, toiled prodigiously to complete the constructions which were to be a central feature in the new alliance. On a base very far removed from the hub, on a base securely anchored and concealed among the gravitic swirlings and shiftings of a subspace turbulence area, virtually indetectable, the monster could make a very valuable partner. If it was discovered, the partnership could be disowned. So could the fact that they had constructed the substation for it, in itself a grave breach of Federation treaties. They built the substation. They built the armed subterranean observer's dome three days' travel away from it. The plasmoid was installed in its new quarters. It then requested the use of the Vishni fleet people for further experimentation. The hierarchy was glad to grant the request. It would have had to get rid of those two well-informed hirelings in any case. Having received its experimental material, the plasmoid requested the De Vegas to stay away from the substation for a while. End of chapter 26「Chapter Twenty Seven of Legacy by James H. Schmitz. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Legacy, Chapter Twenty Seven. The De Vegas said, Lyad, while not too happy with their allies' increasingly independent attitude, were more anxious than ever to see the alliance progress to the working stage. As an indication of its potential usefulness. The monster had provided them with a variety of working plasmoid robots, built to their own specifications. What kind of specifications? Trigger inquired. Lyad hadn't learned in detail, but some of the robots appeared to have demonstrated rather alarming possibilities. Those possibilities, however, were precisely what intrigued the hierarchy most. Mantellus smacked his lips thoughtfully and shook his head. Not good, he said not at all good. I'm beginning to think." He paused a moment. "'Go on, Lyad." The hierarchy was now giving renewed consideration to a curious request the plasmoid had made almost as soon as Belmorden became capable of understanding it. The request had been to find and destroy Plasmoid 113A. The Ermitine's amber eyes switched to Trigger. "'Shall I?' she asked. Trigger nodded and a specific human being. The De Vegas already had established that this human being must be Trigger Argy. What? Mantellish's thick white eyebrows shot up. 113A we can understand. It is afraid of being in some way brought back under control. But why Trigger? Because, Lyad said carefully, 112 was aware that 113A intended to condition Trigger into being its interpreter. Professor Mantellus's jaw dropped. He swung his head toward Trigger. Is that true? She nodded. It's true, all right. We've been working on it, but we haven't got too far along. Tell you later. Go ahead, Lyad. The De Vegas, naturally, hadn't acted on the King Plasmoid's naive suggestion. Whatever it feared was more than likely to be very useful to them. Instead, they made preparations to bring both 113A and Trigger Argy into their possession. They would then have a new, strong bargaining point in their dealings with their dubious partner. 
but they discovered promptly that neither Trigger nor 113A were at all easy to come by. Balmordan now suggested a modification of tactics. The hierarchy had seen to it that a number of interpreters were available for 112. Balmordan, in consequence, had lost much of his early importance and was anxious to regain it. His proposal was that all efforts should be directed at obtaining 113A. Once it was obtained, he himself would volunteer to become its first interpreter. Trigger Argy, because of the information she might reveal to others, should be destroyed, a far simpler operation than attempting to take her alive. This was agreed to, and Balmordan was authorized to carry out both operations. Mantelish had begun shaking his head again. No, he said suddenly and loudly. He looked at Lyad, then at Trigger. Trigger, he said. Yes, said Trigger. Take that deceitful woman to her cabin, Mantelish ordered. Lock her up. I have something to say to the Commissioner. Trigger arose. All right, she said. Come on, Lyad. The two of them left the lounge. Mantelish stood up and went over to the Commissioner. He grasped the Commissioner's jacket lapels. Holadi, old friend, he began emotionally. What is it, old friend? the Commissioner inquired. What I have to say, Mantelish rumbled, will shock you. Profoundly. No, exclaimed the Commissioner. Yes, said Mantelish. That plasmoid 112. It has, of course, an almost inestimable potential value to civilization. Of course, the Commissioner agreed. But it also, said Mantelish, represents a quite intolerable threat to civilization. Mantelish, cried the Commissioner, it does. You don't comprehend these matters as I do. Holadi, that plasmoid must be destroyed, secretly, if possible, and by us. Mantelish, gasped the Commissioner, you can't be serious. I am. Well, said Commissioner Tate, sit down. I'm open to suggestions. Space armor drill hadn't been featured much in the Colonial School's crowded curriculum, but the Commissioner broke out one of the ship's two heavy-duty suits. And when Trigger wasn't at the controls, eating, sleeping, or taking care of the ship's housekeeping with Lyad and Mantelish, she drilled. She wasn't at the controls too often. When she was, they had to surface and proceed in normal space. But Lyad, not too surprisingly, turned out to be a qualified subspace pilot. Even less surprisingly, she already had made a careful study of the ship's controls. After a few hours of instruction, she went on shift with the Commissioner along the less rugged stretches. In this area, none of the stretches were smooth. When not on duty, Lyad lay on her bunk and brooded. Mantelish tried to be useful. Repulsive might have been brooding, too. He didn't make himself noticeable. Time passed. The stretches got rougher. The last ten hours the Commissioner didn't stir out of the control seat. Lyad had been locked in her cabin again as the critical period approached. In normal space, the substation should have been in clear detector range by now. Here the detectors gave occasional blurry, uncertain indications that somewhere in the swirling energies about them might be something more solidly material. It was like creeping through jungle thickets towards the point where a dangerous quarry lurked. They eased down on the coordinate points. They came sliding out between two monstrous twisters. The detectors leaped to life. "'Ship!' said the Commissioner. He swore. "'Frigate class!' he said an instant later. He turned his head toward Trigger. "'Get Lyad. They're in communication range. We'll let her communicate.' Trigger, heart-hammering, ran to get Lyad. The Commissioner had the short-range communicator on when they came hurrying back to the control room together. "'That the Aurora?' he asked. Lyad glanced at the outline in the detectors. "'It is.' Her face went white. "'Talk to him," he ordered. "'Know their call number?' "'Of course.' Lyad sat down at the communicator. Her hand shook for a moment, then steadied. "'What am I to say?' Just find out what's happened to start with, why they're still here. Then we'll improvise. Get them to come to the screen if you can. 
Lyad's fingers flew over the tabs. The communicator signaled contact. Lyad said evenly, Come in, Aurora. This is the Ermitine. There was a pause, a rather unaccountably long pause, Trigger thought. Then a voice said, Yes, First Lady? Lyad's eyes widened for an instant. Come in on visual, Captain. There was the snap of command in the words. Again a pause. Then suddenly the communicator was looking into the Aurora's control room. A brown-bearded, rather lumpy-faced man in uniform sat before the other screen. There were other uniformed men behind him. Trigger heard the Ermitine's breath suck in and turned to watch Lyad's face. "'Why haven't you carried out your instructions, Captain?' The voice was still even. "'There was difficulty with the engines, First Lady.' Lyad nodded. "'Very well. Stand by for new instructions.' She switched off the communicator. She twisted around toward the Commissioner. "'Get us out of here,' she said, chalk-faced. "'Fast! Those aren't my men!' Flame bellowed about them in subspace. The Commissioner's hand slapped a button. The flame vanished and stars shone all around. The engines hurled them forward. Twelve seconds later they angled and dived again. Subspace reappeared. "'Guess you are right,' the Commissioner said. He idled the engines and scratched his chin. But what were they? Everything about it was wrong, Lyad was saying presently, her face still white. Their faces in particular were deformed. She looked at Trigger. You saw it? Trigger nodded. She suspected she was on the white-faced side herself. The captain, she said, I didn't look at the others. It looked as if his cheeks and forehead were pushed out of shape. There was a short silence. Well, said the commissioner, seems like that plasmoid has been doing some more experimenting. Question is, how did it get to them? They didn't find any answers to that. Lyad insisted the Aurora had been given specific orders to avoid the immediate vicinity of the substation. Its only purpose there was to observe and report on anything that seemed to be going on in the area. She couldn't imagine her crew disobeying the orders. That mind-level control business, Trigger said finally. Maybe it found a way of going out to them. She could see by their faces that the idea had occurred, and that they didn't like it. Well, neither did she. They pitched a few more ideas around. None of them seemed helpful. Unless we just want to hightail it, the Commissioner said finally, about the only thing we can do is go back and slug it out with the frigate first. We can't risk snooping around the station while she's there and likely to start pounding on our backs any second. Mantellish looked startled. Holati, he cautioned, that's a warship. Mantellish, the Commissioner said a trifle coldly, what you've been riding in isn't a canoe. He glanced at Lyad. I suppose you'd feel happier if you weren't locked up in your cabin during the ruckus. Lyad gave him a strained smile. Commissioner, she said, you're so right. Then keep your seat, he said. We'll start prowling. They prowled. It took an hour to recontact the Aurora, presumably because the Aurora was also prowling for them. Suddenly the detectors came alive. The ship's guns went off at once. Then subspace went careening crazily past in the screens. Trigger looked at the screens for a few seconds, gulped, and started studying the floor. Whatever the plasmoid had done to the frigate's crew, they appeared to have lost none of their ability to give battle. It was a very brisk affair. But neither had the one-time squadron commander Tate lost much of his talent along those lines. The frigate had many more guns, but no better range and he had the faster ship. Four minutes after the first shots were exchanged, the Aurora blew up. The ripped hunk of the Aurora's hull, which the Commissioner presently brought into the lock, appeared to have had three approximately quarter-inch holes driven at a slant through it, which subsequently had been plugged again. The plugging material was plasmoid in character. There were two holes in another piece, the Commissioner said very thoughtfully. If that's the average, she was punched in a few thousand spots. Let's go have a better look. 
He and Mantellish maneuvered the gravity crane carrying the whole slab of steel alloy into the ship's workshop. Lyad was locked back into her cabin, and Trigger went on guard in the control room and looked out wistfully at the stars of normal space. Half an hour later, the two men came up the passage and joined her. They appeared preoccupied. "'It's an unpleasant picture, Trigger girl,' the Commissioner said. "'Those holes look sort of chewed through. Whatever did the chewing was also apparently capable of sealing up the portion behind it as it went along. What it did to the men when it got inside we don't know. Mantellish feels we might compare it roughly to the effects of ordinary germ invasion. It doesn't really matter. It fixed them." "'Mighty large germs,' Trigger said. "'Why didn't their meteor reflectors stop them? If the ship was hove to, and these things just drifted in gradually—' "'Oh, I see. That wouldn't activate the reflectors. Then, if we keep moving ourselves—' "'That,' said the Commissioner, "'was what I had in mind.'" End of chapter 27"'Chapter 28 of Legacy by James H. Schmitz. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Legacy. Chapter 28. Trigger couldn't keep from staring at the subspace station. It was unbelievable. One could still tell that the human construction gangs had put up a standard type of armored station down there, a very big, very massive one, but normally shaped, nearly spherical. One could tell it only by the fact that at the gun pits the original material still showed through. Everywhere else it had vanished under great black masses of material which the plasmoids had added to the station structure. All over that black, lumpy, lava-like surface the plasmoids crawled, walked, soared, and wriggled. There were thousands of them perhaps hundreds of different types. It looked like a wet, black, rotten stump swarming with life inside and out. Neither she nor the two men had made much mention of its appearance. All you could say was that it was horrible. The plasmoids they could see ignored the ship. They also gave no noticeable attention to the eight space flares the Commissioner had set in a rough cube about the station. But for the first two hours after their arrival, the ship's meteor reflectors remained active. An occasional tap at first, then an almost continuous pecking, finally a twenty-minute drum fire that filled the reflector screens with madly dancing clouds of tiny sparks. Suddenly it ended. Either the King Plasmoid had exhausted its supply of that particular weapon, or it preferred to conserve what it had left. "'Might test their guns,' the Commissioner muttered. He looked very unhappy, Trigger thought. He circled off, put on speed, came back and flicked the ship past the station's flank. He drew bursts from two pits with a promptness which confirmed what already had been almost a certainty, that the gun installations operated automatically. They seemed remarkably feeble weapons for a station of that size. The de Vegas apparently had had sense enough not to give the plasmoid every advantage. The Commissioner plunked a test shot next to one of the black protuberances. A small fiery crater appeared. It darkened quickly again. Out of the biggest opening, down near what would have been the foot of the stump if it had been a stump, something long, red and warm-like wriggled rapidly. It flowed up over the structure's surface to the damaged point and thrust the tip of its front end into the crater. Black material began to flow from the tip. The plasmoid moved its front end back and forth across the damaged area. Others of the same kind came out and joined it. The crater began to fill out. They hauled away a little and surfaced. Normal space looked clean, beautiful, homelike, calmly shining. None of them except Lyad had slept for over twenty hours. "'What do you think?' the Commissioner asked. They discussed what they had seen in subdued voices. Nobody had a plan. They agreed that one thing they could be sure of was that the Vishni fleet people and any other human beings who might have been on the station when it was turned over to the King Plasmoid were no longer alive. Unless, of course, something had been done to them much more drastic than had happened to the Aurora's crew. 
The ship had passed by the biggest opening, like a low, wide, black mouth, close enough to make out that it extended far back into the original station's interior. The station was open and airless as Harvest Moon had been before the humans got there. Some of those things down there, the Commissioner said, had attachments that would crack any suit wide open. A lot of them are big, and a lot of them are fast. Once we were inside, we'd have no maneuverability to speak of. If the termites didn't get to us before we got inside, suits won't do it here." He was a gambler, and a gambler doesn't buck impossible odds. "'What could you do with the guns?' Trigger asked. "'Not too much. They're not meant to take down a fortress. Scratching around on the surface with them would just mark the thing up. We can widen that opening by quite a bit, and once it's widened, I can flip in the bomb. But it would be just blind luck if we nailed the one we're after that way. With a dozen bombs we could break up the station, but we don't have them." They nodded thoughtfully. The worst part of that, he went on, is that it would be completely obvious. The Council's right when it worries about fumbles here. Trenest and the De Vegas know the thing is in there. If the Federation can't produce it, both those outfits have the Council over a barrel. Or we could be setting up the hub for fifty years of fighting among the member worlds sometime in the next few hours." Mantellish and Trigger nodded again, more thoughtfully. Nevertheless, Mantellish began suddenly, he checked himself. Well, you're right, the Commissioner said. That stuff down there just can't be turned loose, that's all. The thing's still only experimenting. We don't know what it's going to wind up with. So I guess we'll be trying the guns and the bomb finally, and then see what else we can do. Now look, we've got, what is it, nine or ten hours left? The first of the boys are pretty sure to come helling in around then. Or maybe something's happened we don't know about, and they'll be here in thirty minutes. We can't tell. But I'm in favor of knocking off now and just grabbing a couple of hours' sleep. Then we'll get our brains together again. Maybe by then somebody has come up with something like an idea. What do you say?" Where, Mantella said, is the ship going to be while we're sleeping? Subspace, said the Commissioner. He saw their expressions. Don't worry. I'll put her on a wide orbit and I'll stick out every alarm on board. I'll also sleep in the control chair. But in case somebody gets here early, we've got to be around to tell them about that space termite trick." Trigger hadn't expected she would be able to sleep, not where they were. But afterwards she couldn't even remember getting stretched out all the way on the bunk. She woke up less than an hour later, feeling very uncomfortable. Repulsive had been talking to her. She sat up and looked around the dark cabin with frightened eyes. After a moment, she got out of the bunk and went up the passage toward the lounge and the control section. Holati Tate was lying slumped back in his chair, eyes closed, breathing slowly and evenly. Trigger put out a hand to touch his shoulder and then drew it back. She glanced up for a moment at the plasmoid station in the screen, seeming to turn slowly as they went orbiting by it. She noticed that one of the space flares they planted there had gone out or else it had been plucked away by a passing twister's touch. She looked away quickly again, turned and went restlessly back through the lounge and up the passage toward the cabins. She went by the two suits of space armor at the lock without looking at them. She opened the door to Mantellish's cabin and looked inside. The professor lay sprawled across the bunk in his clothes, breathing slowly and regularly. Trigger closed his door again. Lyad might be wakeful, she thought. She crossed the passage and unlocked the door to the Ermitine's cabin. The lights in the cabin were on, but Lyad also lay placidly asleep, her face relaxed and young-looking. Trigger put her fist to her mouth and bit down hard on her knuckles for a moment. She frowned intensely at nothing. Then she closed and locked the cabin door, went back up the passage and into the control room. She sat down before the communicator, glanced up once more at the plasmoid station in the screen, got up restlessly, and went over to the Commissioner's chair. She stood there, looking down at him. The Commissioner slept on. 
then repulsive said it again. No, Trigger whispered fiercely. I won't. I can't. You can't make me do it. There was a stillness then. In the stillness it was made very clear that nobody intended to make her do anything. And then the stillness just waited. She cried a little. So this was it. All right, she said. The armor suit's triple light beam blazed into the wide, low, black, wet looking mouth rushing toward her. It was much bigger than she had thought when looking at it from the ship. Far behind her, the fire needles of the single gun pit which her passage to the station had aroused still slashed mindlessly about. They weren't geared to stop suits, and they hadn't come anywhere near her. But the plasmoids looked geared to stop suits. They were swarming in clusters in the black mouth like maggots in a rotting skull. Part of the swarms had spilled out over the lips of the mouth, clinging, crawling, rippling swiftly about. Trigger shifted the flight controls with the fingers of one hand, dropping a little, then straightening again. She might be coming in too fast. But she had to get past that mass at the opening. Then the black mouth suddenly yawned wide before her. Her left hand pressed the gun handle. Twin blasts stabbed ahead, blinding white, struck the churning masses, blazed over them. They burned, scattered, exploded, and rolled back, burning and exploding in a double wave to meet her. Too fast, Repulsive said anxiously. Much too fast. She knew it, but she couldn't have forced herself to do it slowly. The armor suit slammed at a slant into a piled, writhing, burning hardness of plasmoid bodies, bounced upward. She went over and over, yanking down all the way on the flight controls. She closed her eyes for a moment. When she opened them again, the suit hung poised a little above black, uneven flooring, turned back half toward the entrance mouth. A black ceiling was less than twenty feet above her head. The plasmoids were there. The suit's light beams played over the massed, moving ranks, squat bodies and sinuous ones, immensities that scraped the ceiling, stalked limbs and gaping nutcracker jaws, blurs of motion her eyes couldn't step down to define into shapes. Some still blazed with their guns' white fire. The closest were thirty feet away. They stayed there. They didn't come any closer. She swung the suit slowly away from the entrance. The ring closed all about her, but it wasn't tightening. Repulsive had thought he could do it. She asked in her mind, Which way? She got a feeling of direction, turned the suit a little more, and started it gliding forward. The ranks ahead didn't give way, but they went down. Those that could go down. Some weren't built for it. The suit bumped up gently against one huge bulk and a six-inch, pale-blue eye looked at her for a moment as she went circling around it. Eyes for what? Somebody in the back of her mind wondered briefly. She glanced into the suit's rear-view screen and saw that the ones who had once gone down were getting up again, mixed with the ones who came crowding after her. Thirty feet away. Repulsive was doing it. So far there weren't any guns. If they hit guns, that would be her job and the suit's. The King Plasmoid should be regretting by now that it had wasted its experimental human material. Though it mightn't have been really wasted. It might be incorporated in the stuff that came crowding after her and kept going down ahead. Black ceiling, black floor seemed to stretch on endlessly. She kept the suit moving slowly along. At last the beams picked up low walls ahead, converging at the point toward which the suit was gliding. At the point of convergence there seemed to be a narrow passage. Plasmoid bodies were wedged into it. The suit pulled them out one by one, its steel grippers clamping down upon things no softer than itself. But it had power to work with, and they didn't at the moment. Behind the ones it pulled out there were presently glimpses of the swiftly weaving motion of giant red worm shapes sealing up the passage. After a while they stopped weaving each time the suit returned and started again as it withdrew, dragging out another plasmoid body. 
Then the suit went gliding over a still tangle of red worm bodies, and there was the sealed end of the passage. The stuff was still soft. The guns blazed, bit into it, aided away, their brilliance washing back over the suit. The ceiling gave way before the suit did. They went through and came out into... She didn't know what they had come out into. It was like a fog of darkness, growing thicker as they went sliding forward. The light beam seemed to be dimming. Then they quietly went out as if they'd switched themselves off. In blackness, she fingered the light controls and knew they weren't switched off. "'Repulsive!' she cried in her mind. Repulsive couldn't help with the blackness. She got the feeling of direction. The blackness seemed to be soaking behind her eyes. She held the speed throttle steady in fingers slippery with sweat, and that was the only way she could tell they were still moving forward. After a while they bumped gently against something that had to be a wall it was so big, though at first she wasn't sure it was a wall. They moved along it for a time, then came to the end of it and were moving in the right direction again. They seemed to be in a passage now, a rather narrow one. They touched walls and ceiling from time to time. She thought they were moving downward. There was a picture in front of her. She realized suddenly that she had been watching it for some time. But it wasn't until this moment that she became really aware of it. The beast was big, strong, and angry. It bellowed and screamed, shaking and covered with foam. She couldn't see it too clearly, but she had the impression of mad, staring eyes and a terrible lust to crush and destroy. But something was holding it. Something held it quietly and firmly, for all its plunging. It reared once more now, a gross, lumbering hugeness, and came crashing down to its knees. Then it went over on its side. The suit's beams flashed on. Trigger squeezed her eyes tight shut, blinded by the light that flashed back from the black walls all around. Then her fingers remembered the right drill and dimmed the lights. She opened her eyes again and stared for a long moment at the great gray mummy shape before one of the black walls. Repulsive? she asked in her mind. Repulsive didn't answer. The suit hung quietly in the huge black chamber. She didn't remember having stopped it. She turned it now slowly. There were eight or nine passages leading out of here, through walls, ceiling, floor. Repulsive! she cried plaintively. Silence. She glanced once more at the king plasmoid against the wall. It stayed silent, too. And it was as if the two silences cancelled each other out. She remembered the last feeling of moving downward and lifted the suit toward a passage that came in through the ceiling. She hung before it, considering. Far up and back in its darkness, a bright light suddenly blazed, vanished and blazed again. Something was coming down the passage fast. Her hand started for the gun handle. Then it remembered another drill and flashed to the suit's communicator. A voice crashed in around her. Trigger, 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 it sobbed. Ape, she screamed. You aren't hurt? End of chapter 28Chapter 29 of Legacy by James H. Schmitz. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Legacy, Chapter 29. Mantellish's garden in the highlands south of Sacy had a certain renown all over the hub. It had been donated to the professor twenty-five years ago by the populace of another Federation world. That populace had negligently permitted a hideous pestilence of some kind to be imported, and had been saved in the nick of time by the appropriate pestilence killer, hastily developed and forwarded to it by Mantellish. In return, a lifetime ambition had been fulfilled for him, his own private botanical garden, plus an unlimited fund for stocking and upkeep. To one side of the big garden house, where Mantellish stayed whenever he found the time to go puttering around among his specimens, stood a giant sequoia, generally reputed to be the oldest living thing in the hub outside of the life-banks. 
It was certainly extremely old, even for a sequoia. For the last decade there had been considerable talk about the advisability of removing it before it collapsed and crushed the house and everyone in it. But it was one of the professor's great favorites, and so far he had vetoed the suggestion. Elbows propped on the broad white balustrade of the porch before her third-story bedroom, Trigger was studying the sequoia's crown with a pair of field-glasses when Pilch arrived. She laid the glasses down and invited her guest to pull up a chair and help her admire the view. They admired the view for a little in silence. "'It certainly is a beautiful place,' Pilch said then. She glanced down at Professor Mantellish, a couple of hundred yards from the house, dressed in a pair of tanned shorts and busily grubbing away with a spade around some new sort of shrub he just planted, and smiled. "'I took the first opportunity I've had to come see you,' she said. Trigger looked at her and laughed. "'I thought you might. You weren't satisfied with the reports, then?' Pilt said. "'Of course not. But it was obvious the emergency was over, so I was whisked away to something else.' She frowned slightly. "'Sometimes,' she admitted, "'the service keeps me the least bit busier than I prefer to be. So now it's been six months.' "'I would have come in for another interview if you'd called me.' Trigger said. I know, said Pilch, but that would have made it official. I can keep this visit off the record. Her eyes met Trigger's for a moment. And I have a feeling I will. Also, of course, I'm not pushing for any answers you mightn't care to give. Just push away, Trigger said agreeably. Well, we got the Commissioner's call from his ship. A worried man he was. So it seems now that we've had one of the old galactics around for a while. When did you first find out about it? On the morning after our interview, right after I got up. How? Trigger laughed. I watched my weight. When I noticed I'd turned three and a half pounds heavier overnight than I'd averaged the past four years, I knew all right. Pilch smiled faintly. You weren't alarmed at all? No. I guess I'd been prepared just enough by that time. By then, you know, I forgot all about it again until Lyot and Flam opened that purse, and he wasn't inside. Then I remembered, and after that I didn't forget again. No, of course. Pilch's slim fingers tapped the surface of the table between them. She said then, paying repulsive the highest compliment Pilch could give, It, he, was a good therapist. After a moment she added, "'I had a talk with Commissioner Tate an hour or so ago. He's preparing to leave McCadden again, I understand. That's right. He's been organizing that big exploration trip of Mantellish's the past couple of months. He'll be in charge of it when they take off.' "'You're not going along?' Pilch asked. Trigger shook her head. "'Not this time.' "'Ape and I—Captain Quillen and I, that is—I heard—' Pilt said. She smiled. You picked a good one on the second try. Quillen's all right, Trigger agreed, if you watch him a little. Anyway, said Pilch, Commissioner Tate seems to be just the least bit worried about you still. Trigger put a finger to her temple and made a small circling motion. A bit ta-ta? Not exactly that, perhaps. But it seems, said Pilch, that you've told him a good deal about the history of the old galactics, including what ended them as a race thirty-two thousand years ago." Trigger's face clouded a little. "'Yes,' she said. She sat silent for a moment. "'Well, I got that from Repulsive somewhere along the line,' she said then. It didn't really come clear until some time after we'd got back, but it was there in those pictures in the interview. The giants stamping on the farm? Trigger nodded. And the fast clock and the slow one. He was trying to tell it then. The gestures. That's the giants. They're fast and tough like us. Apparently, Trigger said thoughtfully, they're a good deal like us in a lot of ways. But worse. Much worse. And the old galactics were just slow. They thought slow. They moved slow. They did almost everything slow. At full gallop, 
Old Repulsive couldn't have kept up with a healthy snail. Besides, they just liked to grow things and tinker with things and so on. They didn't go in for fighting, and they never got to be at all good at it, so they just got wiped out practically. The jesters were good at fighting, eh? Trigger nodded. Very good. Like us again. Where did they come from? Repulsive thought they were outsiders. He wasn't sure. He and that other O.G. were on the sidelines, running their protein collecting station, when the jesters arrived. And it was all over, and they were gone before he had learned much about it. From outside the galaxy, Pilt said thoughtfully. She cleared her throat. What's this business about they might be back again? Well, Trigger said, he thought they might be. Just might. Actually, he believed the jesters got wiped out, too. Eh? Pilt said. How's that? Quite a lot of the old Galactics went along with them, like Repulsive went along with me. And one of the things they did know, Trigger said, was how to spread diseases like nobody's business. About like we use weed killers. Wholesale. They could clean out the average planet of any particular thing they didn't want there in about a week. So it's not really too likely the jesters will be back. Oh, said Pilch. But if they are coming, Repulsive thought they'd be due in this area in about another eight centuries. That looked like a very short time to him, of course. He thought it would be best to pass on a warning. You know, Pilt said after a brief pause, I find myself agreeing with him there, Trigger. I might turn in a short report on this after all. I think you should, really, Trigger said. She smiled suddenly. Of course. It might wind up with people thinking both of us are ta-ta. I'll risk that, said Pilch. It's been thought of me before. If they did come, Trigger said, I guess we'd take them anyway. We've taken everything else like that that came along. And besides... Her voice trailed off thoughtfully. She studied the tabletop for a moment. Then she looked up at Pilch. Well, she said, smiling, any other questions?" A few, said Pilch, passing up the and besides. She considered. Did you ever actually see him make contact with you? No, Trigger said. I was asleep, and I suppose he made sure I'd stayed asleep. They're built sort of like a leech, you know. I guess he knew I wouldn't feel comfortable about having something like that go oozing into the side of my neck or start oozing out again. Anyway, he never did let me see it. "'Considerate little fellow,' said Pilch. She sighed. "'Well, everything came out very satisfactorily. Much more so than anyone could have dared hope at one time. All that's left is a very intriguing mystery which the Hub will be chatting about for years. What happened aboard Dr. Fale's vanished ship that caused the King Plasmoid to awaken to awful life?' she cried. What equally mysterious event brought about its death on that strangely hideous structure it had built in subspace? What was it planning to do there, etc.? She smiled at Trigger. Yes, very good. I saw they camouflaged out what was still visible of the original substation before they led in the news viewers, Trigger remarked. Bright idea somebody had there. Yes, it was I and the De Vega's hierarchy is broken, and the Ermitides run out of Trinest. Two very bad spots, those were. I don't recall having heard what they did to your friend Pluley. I heard, Trigger said. He just got blacklisted by Grand Commerce finally and lost all his shipping concessions. However, his daughter is married to an up-and-coming young businessman who happened to be on hand and have the money and other qualifications to pick up those concessions. She laughed. It's the Inger lines now. They're smart characters, in a way." Yes, said Pilch, in a way. Did you know Lyad Ermitine put in for voluntary rehabilitation with us, and then changed her mind and joined the service? I'd heard of it. Trigger hesitated. Did you know Lyad paid me a short visit about an hour before you got here this morning? I thought she would, Pilch said. We came in to McCadden together. Trigger had been a little startled when she answered the door-chime and saw Lyad standing there. 
She invited the Ermitine in. "'I thought I'd thank you personally,' Lyad said casually, "'for a recording which was delivered to me some months ago.' "'That's quite all right,' Trigger said, also casually. "'I was sure I wasn't going to have any use for it.' Lyad studied her face for a moment. "'To be honest about it, Trigger R.G.,' she said, "'I still don't feel entirely cordial toward you. However, I did appreciate the gesture of letting me have the recording. So I decided to drop by to tell you there isn't really too much left in the way of hard feelings on my part." They shook hands restrainedly, and the Ermitine sauntered out again. "'The other reason she came here,' Pilt said, "'is to take care of the financing of Mantellish's expedition.' "'I didn't know that,' Trigger said, surprised. "'It's her way of making amends. Her legitimate hub-holdings are still enormous, of course. She can afford it." "'Well,' Trigger said, "'that's one thing about Lyad. She's wholehearted.' "'She's that,' said Pilch. "'Rarely have I seen anyone rip into total therapy with the verve displayed by the Ermitine. She mentioned on one occasion that there simply had to be some way of getting ahead of you again." "'Oh,' said Trigger. "'Yes,' said Pilch. "'By the way, what are your own plans nowadays, aside from getting married?" Trigger stretched slim tanned arms over her head and grinned. "'No immediate plans,' she said. "'I've resigned from pre-call. Got a couple of checks from the Federation. One to cover my expenses on that plasmoid business, that was the Dawn City Fair, mainly, and the other for the five-week special duty they figured I was on for them. So I'm up to five thousand crowns again and I thought I'd just loaf around and sort of think things over, till Quillen gets back from his current assignment." "'I see. When is Major Quillen returning?' "'In about a month. It's Captain Quillen at present, by the way.' "'Oh?' said Pilch. "'What happened?' "'That unwarranted interference with the political situation business. They'd broadcast a warning against taking individual action of any kind against the plasmoid station. But when he got there, and heard the Commissioner was in a kind of coma, and I wasn't even on board, he lost his head and came charging into the station after me, flinging grenades and so on around. The plasmoids would have finished him off pretty quick, except most of them had started slowing down as soon as Repulsive turned off the main one. The lunatic was lucky the termites didn't get to him before he even reached the station." Pilt said, "'Termites?' Trigger told her about the termites. Ugh," said Pilch. I hadn't heard about those. So they broke him for that. It hardly seems right. Well, you have to have discipline," Trigger said tolerantly. Ape's a bit short on that end, anyway. They'll be upgrading him again fairly soon, I imagine. I might just be going into Space Scout intelligence myself, by the way. They said they'd be glad to have me. Not at all incidentally," remarked Pilch. My service also would be glad to have you." Would they? Trigger looked at her thoughtfully. That includes that total therapy process, doesn't it? Usually, said Pilch. Well, I might some day, but not just yet. She smiled. Let's let Lyad get a head start. Actually, it's just I found out there are so many interesting things going on all around that I'd like to look them over a bit before I go charging seriously into a career again." She reached across the table and tapped Pilch's wrist. "'And I'll show you one interesting thing that's going on right here. Take Mantellish's big tree out there. The sequoia? Yes. Now just last year it was looking so bad they almost talked the professor into having it taken away. Hardly had a green branch left on it. Pilch shaded her eyes and looked at the sequoia's crown far above them. "'It looks,' she observed reflectively, "'in fairly good shape at the moment, I'd say. Yes, and it's getting greener every week. Mantellish brags about a new solvent he's been dosing its roots with. You see that great big branch, like an L turned upward, just a little above the center? Pilch looked again. "'Yes,' she said after a moment. "'I think so.' Just before the L turns upward, there's a little cluster of green branches," Trigger said. I see those, yes. 
Trigger picked up the field glasses and handed them to her. "'Get those little branches in the glasses,' she said. Pilt said presently, "'Got them.' Trigger stood up and faced up to the sequoia. She cupped her hands to her mouth, took a deep breath, and yelled, "'Yoo-hoo! Repulsive!' Down in the garden, Mantella straightened and looked about angrily. Then he saw Trigger and smiled. "'You who yourself, Trigger!' he shouted, and turned back to his spading. Trigger watched Pilch's faces from the side. She saw her give a sudden start. "'Great galaxies!' Pilch breathed. She kept on looking. "'That's one for the book, isn't it?' Finally she put the glasses down. She appeared somewhat stunned. "'He really is a little green man.' Only when he's trying to be. It's a sort of sign of friendliness. What's he doing up there? He moved over into the sequoia right after we got back, Trigger said, and that's where he'll probably stay indefinitely now. It's just the right kind of place for repulsive. Have you been doing any more, well, talking? No. Too strenuous both ways. Until a few days before we got back here, there wasn't even a sign from him. He just about knocked himself out on that big plasmoid. Who else knows about this? asked Pilch. Nobody. I would have told Holati, except he's still mad enough about having been put into a coma, he might go out and chop the sequoia down. Well, it won't go into the report then, Pilch said. They just want to bother repulsive. I knew it would be all right to tell you. And here's something else very interesting that's going on at present. What's that?" The real hush-hush reason for Mantellish's expedition, Trigger explained, is, of course, to scout around this whole area of space with planetary plasmoid detectors. They don't want anybody stumbling on another setup like Harvest Moon and accidentally activating another King Plasmoid. Yes, Pilt said. I'd heard that. It was Mantellish's idea," said Trigger. Now Mantellish is very fond of that sequoia tree. He's got a big comfortable bench right among its roots, where he likes to sit down around noon and have a little nap when he's out here." Oh, said Pilch. Repulsive's been up to his old tricks, eh? Sure. He's given Mantellish very exact instructions. So they're going to find one of those setups all right and they won't come back with any plasmoids. But they will come back with something they don't know about." Pilch looked at her for a moment. "'You say it.' Trigger's grin widened. "'A little green woman,' she said." The End of Legacy by James H. Schmitz